go. Welcome everybody to the big idea where today we are going to be talking about cervicogenic somatosensory tinnitus in a fun little uh, paper here called, let me give it a go, Pilot Study Manual Medicinish Marathon den Valuation der Modular Barkite des Light Symptoms Tinnitus. Okay, yeah, so the article we're going to be looking at today here is going to be in German. Thank goodness we have Google Translator. Ah, there we go, the whole thing in English. And that's what we do here at The Big Idea. We give you important bits of research that are out there and break them down into plain English. Yes, it takes us a little bit of time to actually go through each of the individual studies here, but the reason we do that is so that you can have a better appreciation and understanding about what's going on. And we do this really for two groups of people. Number one are healthcare practitioners who really should be knowing this information, but number two, and arguably more important, are for people who experience these different things so that they know these are actually some of the different options that are available to help out, even if you don't actually know that. And so in this particular one here, we're going to be talking about translated. A pilot study, evaluation of manual methods for modulating the cardinal symptom of tinnitus. And this is going to be looking at both the combination of tinnitus and also dizziness. Now, for those of you who may not be completely familiar, but of course, if you experience tinnitus, you are. It is this persistent ringing in the ears kind of noise. Like imagine that there's just been a loud bang that's gone off in your ear and it's the persistent high pitched sound like that, that can range from just minor annoyance to full deafening and impossible to, to block out. So it's not a, a small thing is the short of it, but to a large uh, extent, it's like having a ghost in the machine as well. But we're going to have a look in this particular article so that we can show you, okay, how is it that something in your neck can actually be connected to what's going on? So let's give you a little bit of the background study. The aim of the present study was to investigate the effect of manual therapy on subject-reported individually perceived impairment due to cervicogenic somatosensory tinnitus, dizziness, and hypertonia of the musculature of the head and cervical spine. 80 patients, there were 40 in the intervention group, 40 in the control group. They were assessed and had some work done. After manual therapy, there was a significant difference in the tinnitus handicap inventory, dizziness handicap inventory, and muscular hypertonia between the groups all in favor of the intervention group. And they conclude, manual examination and therapy proved to be effective. It should be increasingly applied in the absence of ENT pathology and suspected cervicogenic somatosensory tinnitus. Okay. So really good overall summary. What they're finding is that by working in people's necks, in a nutshell, that it's helping to significantly reduce symptoms of tinnitus and also dizziness for these people and also what they're calling a hypertonia of the musculature. Hypertonia means too tight, too much muscle tension is the uh, kind of the short of it. So Let's kind of go through a few of the bits and pieces here and then have a, a few little discussions on what all of this is. So the objective tinnitus results from endogenous sound source. Uh, so they're basically, firstly, they're making, well, actually rewind here a little bit. Back up, back up, back up, back up, back up. Two general categories of tinnitus. The first one is going to be neurogenic damage is the short of it. So you can imagine that there is a demonstrable lesion of the uh, acoustic nerve in your brain. Cancer, uh, a bleed, something like that. There's damage to the actual hardware itself. We're not talking about that. We're also not talking about tinnitus that's brought on, say, by industrial deafness. Prolonged exposure to certain noises. Machinery loud bangs, so such as uh, if you're a police officer at a firing range, if you work um, near airplanes all of the time, things like that where you would be having to wear uh, earmuffs, uh, heavy uh, tools, uh, things like that. So we're saying that we are needing to be making sure that we are not dealing with, firstly, the ENT type of pathology, 
that is actually producing the tinnitus. Person's been to their GP, they've been to the ENT, and they've said, you know, your hearing seems to be, the, the parts on the inside, they're working okay. We don't know where this is coming from. That's what we're talking about here. And so they break it down then and use the term, what's called a somatosensory tinnitus. So what's a somatosensory tinnitus? Somatosensory tinnitus refers to tinnitus being a functional nerve disorder. And I want you to imagine it as a certain extent static on a radio. So you have all of the different joints of your body, particularly of your neck and of your jaw, huge amounts of density in that area. And the interesting thing about these joints, they really contain three kinds of nerve receptors, pain receptors, proprioceptors, which are involved in regulating muscle tone, tension, balance, things like that, and then what are called pressure or mechanoreceptors. And mechanoreceptors, they are detecting physical movements. Now, here's the interesting thing is in order for us as human beings to be able to stand, to be upright, we need to have proper coordination between our different senses, our senses of balance and equilibrium, our eyes, and also our ears. It's one of the reasons why we have this reflex that if you hear bang, this loud noise go off to the side, you reflexively turn your head to see and to alert yourself what was that noise, because if it's something dangerous, we need to be propelled into action. What does this mean? It means that these individual nerve receptors, these mechanoreceptors, they don't just go to the parts of the brain that are responsible for feeling, for detecting physical movement. They also go to the parts of the brain that are responsible for balance, equilibrium, and hearing. And so the hypothesis is, and we've seen this any number of times, is that there are a certain significant group of people who have some kind of mechanical issue with how the parts of their body are supposed to be moving, whether their jaw or in their neck. They've had a physical injury at some point in the past, and even if it didn't break or dislocate, it hasn't been moving properly for a long period of time. If it's not moving properly, guess what? Those mechanoreceptors are able to detect something isn't right, and they're sending your brain bad information, not just about how your neck is moving per se, but it also goes to the parts that are responsible for hearing. But the brain receives this information, says, what the heck, this doesn't make any sense. And that's what we believe is one of the reasons why a person can then experience this symptom that actually has nothing to do with their ears itself. It's actually coming like a form of static from something else. And so, especially if and when you might be experiencing tinnitus and you experience other things in your body, be it a headache, be it jaw issues, be it neck issues, shoulder issues, these are just some of the, the common ones, there is usually some kind of an underlying link between the two. And it's a matter then of trying to connect the two. So these are the operational premises that they're actually looking at in this particular research. So there's, a, <clears throat> excuse me, when it comes to tinnitus, there can be Ones where it's more of an endogenous sound source. So this is the kind where if a person has something wrong with the ear, it's like they can hear the pulse, what's known as a pulsile tinnitus, where they can literally hear their blood flow because those mechanoreceptors, they are sensitive to it. Um, and in such cases, a GP doctor, we can actually hear these things, which means it can be auscultated. The much more common subjective tinnitus, the pathology is usually localized in the inner ear or in suboptimal auditory information processing. Hearing loss is often the primary cause. The central mechanisms are not yet fully understood. So this is referring to the industrial kind of deafness, so the prolonged nose exposure that we were talking about. But, as we said, this is not actually what we're going to be talking about in this particular study. We're going to be talking about how is it that a problem in the physical body, your head, neck, and jaw, can actually relate to tinnitus. So the current options, at least according to the European Multidisciplinary Guidelines for Tinnitus, which are probably pretty much the same, be it in the uh, Australia or in the U.S. or other places around the world, cochlear implants, hearing aids, neurostimulation, cognitive behavioral therapy, pharmacotherapy, in other words, medication, tinnitus retraining therapy, sound therapy, dietary, or alternative therapies such as acupuncture. 
And really, unfortunately, the only thing they're finding is working here, at least based on the current research, is cognitive behavioral therapy. Teaching a person how to be able to continue to function and to operate despite the sound. And I think as you guys can appreciate here is that, you know, whether you're having, you know, modifications to your ear, hearing aids, things like that, is whether you have something blocking your ears like this, or if you have something to amplify so that you can hear other sounds over the tinnitus, that persistent ringing is still there. So we come down a, a little bit here. The present study was designed to investigate the effectiveness of manual therapy on the symptoms of cervicogenic somatosensory tinnitus and dizziness if there is a corresponding suspicion. So we're looking to see, does something going on in the neck affect tinnitus? So what did they do? They picked people who had either acute or chronic tinnitus, some with dizziness, some without and they also had to say, yeah, I also have something wrong with my neck. In other words, they're not just accepting anybody into the study just because they have, you know, tinnitus. They're doing a few tests first to find out, okay, do you actually have something going on in your neck? So we're not actually going to be treating you, quote unquote, for tinnitus. We're saying, okay, you've got an issue with your cervical spine, with your neck. We're going to be focusing on that. And we want to see if tinnitus is the byproduct is the effect of that. We want to be addressing the underlying cause, not just treating the symptoms, is kind of the, the short of it. Now, the particular manual therapy that they were doing in this particular study here, it was predominantly physiotherapy um, in the sense of doing trigger point muscle work. And the muscles that they were selecting were the following here. So they picked the splenius and the semispinalis capitis. These are two muscles that go from the base of your skull like this down kind of to the midpoint of, um, of your spine, right at that bump basically right there. One of them goes up like this. The other one kind of goes down like that, but relatively close to midline is the short of that. The temporalis and the masseter. Temporalis is a muscle here. Masseter is your major chewing muscle located right here. Also, your pterygoid medius. This is a muscle that runs basically just under your cheek, deep on the inside, so that if you were to see my cheek and then my jawline right here, if I brought my finger right into the corner there, that's essentially the spot where that particular muscle is. Other musculature of the mouth, so eh, other muscles around the mouth that let us talk. The trapezius, this is a muscle that goes from the outside of the skull here down basically towards the edge of your shoulder like this. It's a very superficial muscle. You've also got a levator scapula muscle. This goes not from the same spot. So have a look at my ear. Your trap starts here on the bone that's behind your skull and it goes down to your shoulder. The levator scapula, it starts in your neck and goes like that down to the tip of your shoulder blade like this. So one of the muscles that actually runs directly between your shoulder blade and the upper part of your neck. And the last one is one that's called the sternocleidomastoid or SCM. So this one also starts on the back of the skull here, but this one actually runs down along the front of the neck. And it's one of the ones that's very, very common if a person actually feels like their head is tilted you know, to the side like that. So they're saying, okay, well, all of these muscles, we know that they actually contain a large amount of these mechanoreceptors. And they, being relatively superficial structures, we can isolate them, we can be applying trigger point therapies. And if we do that, we want to see if it's going to make a, a little bit of a change in terms of tinnitus symptoms. Now, there's going to be something very important as it relates to muscle activity and how it is that, you know, what we do here in particular is actually not exactly going to be the same of that, that we're actually asking a slightly deeper question in terms of the underlying cause. In other words, okay, if these muscles are tight, why are they tight in the first place? So we'll come back to that one just a little bit later, but just saying, okay, this is the part that we're going to be working on. So what they did, patients in the intervention group received an average of, we'll say, 17 treatments of manual therapy over a period of between 9 and 28 weeks. In other words, basically 3 to 6 months, something like that. Actually, that's not right. 9 weeks, 28 weeks. Yeah, 3 to 6 months, somewhere in there, basically. 
The therapies used included exercises to detonate the hypertonic muscles. Remember, this is translated from German, relax the hypertonic muscles. Myofascial trigger point therapy with muscle and connective tissue techniques and stretching exercises. So they were working to actively stretch and get rid of all of the nasty, gnarly, naughty points. Patients were instructed to do their exercises for 15 minutes a day. Now, how did they measure this? Because as we can appreciate, tinnitus is a symptom. It's not something that we can see from the outside. Your attending physician is not able to measure it in your brain in your body, in your ears. This is something that people experience. And so what we have to depend on is, okay, well, how would you rate the severity of that experience? And so what they're using are questionnaires, what's called a tinnitus handicap inventory, a dizziness handicap inventory, and also symptom questionnaire. And what they were doing here was they were working to grade the severity of the tinnitus. Grade one being, it's there, but it doesn't really, you know, do anything there. It's just, eh, it's there to grade five, which would be completely disruptive, basically not able to sleep, not able to think, not able to function, not basically able to do anything at all. And so depending on the severity here, they took an initial baseline measurement. And then after doing the treatment protocol, they wanted to see, well, how did that actually change? And here essentially are the raw data results of what they found. But we're just going to give you the summary because I've already talked quite a bit too much. So here are going to be some of the interesting bits. So here you have the, okay, so tinnitus handicap inventory. So this is the tinnitus side of the equation. This is the dizziness side of the equation. I'll actually back up a little sec because really I haven't spoken too much about the dizziness part of the equation here just yet. So, so far we've just been talking about the pressure receptors. But remember that I also said the proprioceptors? The ones that are involved with muscle tone, tension, balance, and equilibrium, well, same thing, is if you've got tension or problems involving these nerve scepters in these exact same muscles, they're going to go to the parts of the brain that are closely associated with hearing, but are that are associated with a person's sense of balance. And so people who experience disruptions in their balance, they don't have true blue vertigo, where the whole world is spinning around them. They feel like they're perpetually on a boat like this, which again can be a minor nuisance to extremely disruptive because a person always feels like somebody is pushing their body around like this and drives them absolutely insane. So this is the tinnitus side here. This is the dizziness side here. So slight improvements, um, you know, 32, 21. So you actually saw, you know, slight improvement in people who were just in the control group. Um, same thing goes with the dizziness. Curiously, the control group actually had a greater improvement, but here was the, the interesting part here. This was just if we're talking about, yeah, oh, yeah, there was maybe a bit of a change. Oh, yeah, maybe a bit. We're looking to see if there's a genuine substantial change. So they wanted to know how many people experienced a substantial change and how many points or percent better did it get? So what they found was that in the group experienced the tinnitus, that basically half of all of the people in the study group experienced an almost 20% improvement in their overall tinnitus. In other words, not completely gone. We would love to say, yep, absolutely done, completely gone. But they said it was a marked reduction in the overall, the frequency, the severity, or its impact on their day-to-day -day living. And the same thing went with the dizziness. They were finding that 60, just over 60% of the people, a substantial improvement in some form or another with their overall sense of dizziness. Now, to what extent was that actually having an impact? You know, was that improving 8%, you know, 50%, 100%? Mm, that one's a little bit, you know, more, <coughs> excuse me, tricky, more difficult. Um, but nevertheless, a lot of people saying a lot of improvement with their overall sense of dizziness. Uh, overall, there is a significant effect on manual therapy and the impairment caused by tinnitus and dizziness symptoms with a medium to strong effect. In other words, that if and when people are experience, experiencing this cervicogenic dizziness, so that is they're experiencing tinnitus. So I actually got a couple of my words backwards there. Rewind. They're experiencing tinnitus. 
They're experiencing dizziness. And they also got an assessment to see, hey, something's not right in their neck. That it's probably going to be a big, important idea to treat whatever that underlying condition in the neck is, because it is very likely that it is having a medium to strong effect and is at the very least contributing to those symptoms, the tinnitus and to the dizziness. Now, one of the things that I did want to point out in this particular study that they did remark on is they were looking to see, well, what muscles were actually involved? And they didn't really find too much of a pattern, to tell you the truth. Um, but what they did find is that the ones that seemed to be most prominently involved were actually the muscles that were present on the back. So it was that splenius muscle, it was that semispinalis muscle, and it was the trapezius muscle. Um, and so what it means that people were having the different kinds of work down through their back muscles, they were the ones who were noticing and experiencing the greatest amount of improvements. Now, there is something, as I had said, that I'm going to address right here, right now, and it has to do with the question about why, oh, why are these muscles tight in the first place? So one of the common and prevailing beliefs when people say, okay, yep, I've got tight muscles is we say, oh, it's because of posture. It's because of repetitive activities that we do in the course of our day. And that's what's making the tight muscles. Well, if that was true, it would mean that if you do a certain line of work, 100% of everybody who does that exact same type of work is going to be experiencing those symptoms. Or what it also means is everybody who has bad posture is going to be having those particular symptoms. So uh, that's not necessarily the case, shall we say. Second to that, the question, why, oh, why are muscles tight in the first place? Muscles do not do anything unless they are told to do it. So a muscle at rest is actually relaxed. It's not tight. So if a muscle actually does start to tighten, there's a reason for it. Something in the person's body is saying, you need to be tight. And if over a period of time it can actually contract your, yes, it's what's called it's getting physically shorter. But something had to have caused that muscle to get tight in the first place. So the question is, well, what is that? Tight muscles are an effect. Muscle activity is regulated by nerves. Full stop. Nerves are the electrical conduit, the electrical system that control how the muscles get tight. And this is a common thing when people oftentimes go to a massage therapist or they're having myofascial work. These are absolutely awesome because if they just have tight muscles, okay, they do that, the muscle opens up, it relaxes, boom, problem solved. But if a person goes, has the massage work, has the physiotherapy, has the myofascial therapy, and that tight muscle loosens up and then just tightens right back up 10 minutes later, what it means is it means that the tight muscle is also an effect, not the cause. And something else is actually causing that to be tight. Therefore, if you can figure out what the neurological factor is, that's causing the muscle to be tight, if you correct that, that actually is what allows this to relax as the byproduct. In other words, tight, and we don't want you to confuse from this research here that the tight muscles are the cause of the tinnitus or the dizziness. What we're arguing is that the tight muscles are also a symptom of the underlying issue. And you can address them directly, but you may also be able to address something else if that is the case. And this is in particular the relationship that we find with the nature of the work that you know we do as Blair Upper Cervical Chiropractors. What is that? It's where we're looking at the motion, the alignment, the stability, the relationship between the vertebrae in your neck and your central nervous system, your brain, your spinal cord, your body. Are they working right? Because any joint in your body is supposed to move like this, particularly those ones in the neck. But what did we say all the way back in the beginning of this? Your neck has a huge amount of receptors, particularly the C1 and the C2, and also the TMJ. They have a huge amount of receptors, more than anywhere else that we know of in the spine, for those pain, pressure, and proprioceptors. 
So if you've ever had an injury where your head, your neck got jostled, even if there's not bleeding, blood, broken bones, any of that sort of stuff, the normal joint, if it stops moving the way that it's supposed to and it starts to agitate or irritate these surrounding nerves, they can be the thing that actually causes the muscles to tighten as a compensatory reflex mechanism. And if those muscles stay persistently tight over a period of time, they in turn can have that knock-on effect to affect the proprioceptors, the pain receptors, the pressure receptors, and then you develop neck pain, headaches, maybe even migraines, vestibular issues, hearing issues, tinnitus, different things like that, that are actually related to an underlying condition going on in the neck. Again, does this mean that all cases of vertigo, all cases of dizziness, all cases of tinnitus are going to be coming from the neck? Well, no. We said in the very beginning that if you're dealing with organ pathology or if you're dealing with uh, industrial hearing loss, the, this is not going to be the case. So in particular, who are we speaking to? We're talking to people who experience these symptoms. You've had the CTs, you've had the MRIs, and we say we're not finding anything. Things appear to be quote unquote normal. But especially if you also experience some of these restrictions, limitations in terms of how your neck moves, it's a pretty big deal to have a look and see, you know, is something going on here that can be related to what you have going on? I will also add, um, even though the researchers in this particular study said, you know, we didn't really find a correspondence with um, what's going on with the neck. Um, what I personally see for people who do experience this cervicogenic somatosensory tinnitus is that the underlying issue in whatever is going on in their body, it involves and produces some kind of a C1, C2 rotation, usually a counter rotation, um, and also the TMJ. In other words, this, in my opinion, for whatever that's worth, is the major factor in terms of what causes a person to experience tinnitus. Now, the question is, why would a person's jaw be having an issue? Is it a dental primary issue or is it a neuromuscular issue where something is causing the muscles of your jaw to tighten? Or is it maybe a combination of both? So I'm always on the lookout myself to see, okay, well, who are the people who experience tinnitus who I think I can help versus I'm not sure about these people, but I need to make a couple of referrals so that they can get the best possible you know, outcomes and results there. So still a lot of different layers associated with um, tinnitus, a lot of layers. And I would like to say that even in doing this video that, oh, yeah, 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 that always goes away. It's very, very simple. Uh, no, there's a lot of challenges that go in with tinnitus. Um, and oftentimes and frequently what we find is people who do experience underlying neck pain, headaches, dizziness, vertigo, all of these things, those symptoms do get better. And the tinnitus is like that one sticking point. And they say, oh, well, that's the one that I wish that uh, we could get rid of. I completely agree with you. But again, that's not the way that the healing process works. All the healing is going to be happening from the inside. Your body just needs the time and opportunity to be able to do that. So we're trying to set the stage so that that can actually happen. So nevertheless, what do they find? The results of our study show significant effects of manual therapy on tinnitus impairment and vertigo symptoms in suspected cervicogenic somatosensory tinnitus. Now, since a specialist ENT preliminary diagnosis was not a prerequisite in this study, we can assume that the, or excuse me, we cannot assume the confirmed diagnosis of cervicogenic somatosensory tinnitus since there was no other causes were excluded. In other words, they can't, th there is no formal aha, here is the lesion that causes the cervicogenic somatosensory tinnitus. They're having to use logic. We're saying, okay, we have this, we have this, and we have this, and we're having to draw conclusions with a couple of presumptions based on that. In other words, no smoking gun. And truth be it, if there was a smoking gun, somebody would have been able to figure this out a long time ago. But the reality is when it comes to this and so many other neurological or functional neurological disorders, we've got to be able to use our brain to put two and two together to come up with a conclusion that's going to be you know, greater than the whole of the sum of the parts so that we can actually do and find something that is going to help people out with these things. 
So the changes of muscle tone and cervical cranial musculature found at the same time support the hypothesis that there could be a connection between the neck extensors, so the muscles on the back of the neck, and the tinnitus symptoms. This is also supported by other results in the literature. Um, one other um, author, so this is, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this properly, because it could be uh, Michelle's or it could be uh, Michael's, I don't know, found that functional disorders in the cervical spine are more common in somatosensory tinnitus patients than in people without tinnitus. In other words, huh, people who do have this certain form of tinnitus versus people who don't, these people have a whole bunch of neck disorders. Weird. I wonder if there might be a connection. Uh, arthritis in the TMJ, so the temporal mandibular joint, the jaw, seems to be of secondary importance compared to the myogenic dysfunction. So what these guys are saying is something that I had just said, is they said, we don't think that the vast majority of cases who experience tinnitus have the structural mechanical issue originating from here. We think that the predominant issue affects the muscles in terms of how the jaw moves, and that's going to be coming from the neck. Um, our study showed a clear dominance of the neck muscles with the extensor, so the trap, uh, and the levator scapula muscle with the highest significance in the effect size. Again, they say manual therapy. It helped with the, uh, the tinnitus. Um, it helped with the dizziness indexes as well. Now, in the same breath, they're also saying we don't know 100% what the underlying mechanism is here. So let me use their language so that I can um, go back to what we said in the very beginning. The causes in their physiology with regard to the connection between muscles and the symptoms of tinnitus and dizziness have not yet been sufficiently clarified or proven, which is true. One theory, and this is the one that seems to make the most sense, discusses a so-called brainstem irritation model according to which increased electrical stimuli from the tense muscles lead to incorrect wiring in the cranial nerve nuclei and thus trigger short circuits which lead to activation of the posterior cochlear nucleus and vestibular nucleus. So this is that concept that I had described all the way back in the beginning. The idea, again, we don't know this with certainty, but the prevailing idea is that something is going on in this upper part of the neck area here. And what it's doing is it's irritating the brain stem, which is the nerves. You're going to have this information, this agitation here. It's going to go up. It's going to be received in the higher centers of the brain. It's going to say, what is this? It's going to crisscross, go to parts where it doesn't necessarily belong, overloads the circuit, and e, as a consequence, it's this abnormal hearing kind of sensation. So again, not proven, um, but nevertheless, you know, this is what's believed to be the underlying mechanism. And so whether working with, again, physiotherapy, myofascial therapy, um, muscle therapy, massage therapy, or chiropractic, something along these lines, or even acupuncture that they talked about earlier in the article here too, is by looking at tinnitus that it can perhaps have a physical underlying cause and also then a physical underlying solution. It's kind of a big deal to be able to help people when otherwise, you know, there may not be too many of these other things going on. And does it work for 100% of the people? Again, my experience is honestly no, but I would say that it can and does have a significant impact to be able to help people worth enough to where it's worth a fair, proper go. So there we go on this particular article on um, tinnitus and the connection with the neck. Hope that this has made a bit of sense, that you enjoyed, found value with this one here. And thank God, thank God, we did not have to try to do the whole thing for you in German. So if you have found value with this one here, then you know we'll ask you to do a, a few things. Number one, if you haven't already done so, please click the like and subscribe button down in the bottom, whether it's over here or over there, uh, because in brief, what it does, it helps two things. Number one is it helps us and the channel here so that we get more views, more likes. Yay, it helps the Google algorithm. Um, but more importantly, what it does is by helping the Google and the YouTube algorithm, it helps other people who are looking for this particular kind of information to be able to find it. Because unless you are going to dissect and read all of these different bits of research, you may not actually know about the connection between here and what's going on on the inside here. So that's number one. Number two is if you may know or have a fan or a friend, family member, colleague, 
coworker, anything like that, who describes your experience as either a dizziness or a, a or a tinnitus, please do share this video with them because guess what? If you found that there was useful information and value in here, odds are they probably will here as well. Then lastly, number three is if you might be experiencing tinnitus yourself and want to know, okay, just a little bit more information, then what we would actually ask you to do would be to go over to our website, which is atlashealth.com.au, where we've got links to whole bunches of other videos just like this and a whole bunch of articles that talk about the relationship between the alignment, the motion, the stability of the upper neck, how that relates to tinnitus, dizziness, but also to a whole host of other neuromuscular kinds of conditions that affect people's overall health and well-being. So go over there, check us out, atlashealth.com.au for lots more good kinds of information. So we'll finish up the video. As always, thank you guys very, very much. Hope that you have enjoyed this one. And so until next time, take care. Bye-bye.